Greetings from Podcastville, you bad motherfuckers. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by CBDLion.com. Listen, enough is enough. You can't buy CBD oil at a fucking liquor store, all right? You go down there for a bottle of whiskey, you're like, oh, CBD. No, <laughs> it don't fucking work that way. There's professionals and there's fucking shit heels out there trying to sell you fucking Malukia juice and tell you it's CBD. And there you are jumping up and down. I feel fucking great. Little do you know you're drinking fucking sugar water with some of these sperm in it. <laughs> that shit ends today, all right? CBD Lion is the way to go for you. I'm telling you right now. I've been working with these guys for six months. I've been using that product for about eight months. I reached out to them. Why? Because when you go to CBDLion.com, they got the third-party test results. They do everything from start to finish, whether you want to smoke it, drink it, eat a gummy, fucking CBD Lion got you covered. Go to CBD Lion right now and press in. Church. Bam! And get 20% off your first order. The church would also love to welcome to the podcast Express VPM. You're like, Joey, what's Express VPM? You ready? It runs in your background of your computer or phone. Then you use the internet just like you normally would. You download the app, click to connect, and Viola, you're protected. It shields your identity. It doesn't give them no tracking location. And you're totally, totally, totally anonymous. Who else would come at you with something like this? Uncle Joey. Because I don't want no motherfucker to know where I am. And I don't want no motherfucker to know where you are. I heard it's really good for international travel. You got to keep <laughs> these bitches guessing. You understand me? Now do me a favor. Find out how you can get three months. Listen to me. Three months free. Gratis. At ExpressVPN. Dot com slash church. That's Express VPN. E X P R E S S VPN dot com slash church for three months free when you buy a one year package. All right. Visit expressvpn.com slash church to learn more and to take back your privacy. You hear me? Stay black. Kick this motherfucking mule Lee. Grab that bong head and set the herb man free. Rachel Hells Wilson, yeah. what's happened, beautiful? Thanks for having me. Great to have you, man. How are you guys? Good. How are you? I'm high. I know you're making <laughs> strides. You're making little moves here and there. I've been watching you. Thank you, Uncle Joey. For the Joey. last 18 months, and you open up on a row for Felipe. You're always hustling. Uncle Felipe. I don't Felipe. see no fucking bikini shots. <laughs> you know, There's a few. You're there not are out there few. selling your ass. You're out there <laughs> working on your merit. And I uh, really dig the hell out of you. Thank so you so thank much. you for coming on the show. Highest yeah. of compliments. Thank Tremendous. you. It's I an watch, honor to be here. You know, dog, I watch everything. Like oh. people like, well, when can I come on the podcast? There's always a time and a place. Yeah. Let me watch for a little while. Let me see what the fuck you're doing. And I, you know, I follow you on Twitter. I see your tweets. I see your little morning thing. You're popping up. I read about your family, and that really interested me in talking to you about your family because. I would die for them to adopt me. <laughs> like to live they upstairs. would love to have you. I would die to live with a judge, a DA, and then your sister's like a top-notch attorney. Too. She's a prosecutor. She's a fucking yes. prosecutor. Yeah. So breakfast at that motherfucking house <laughs> yes. must be like laws and no, they're interrogations. references to fucking this. <laughs> and, it's not a breakfast. Well, fucking Ark to beat the mill. <laughs> The fucking uh, backhand slap motion from 1988. Listen. Like, that shit makes my dick up. There's evidence. There's objections. There's literally, yeah, you know. My mom was just a, uh, like a real estate attorney, but even just have her, being a kid of an attorney can be rough. Like, they, like they're, uh, and I can't imagine having it from two sides no. and one being a judge. Yeah, my mom definitely has, like, she's the cock and balls, like, for sure. There's a lot of, like, you know intensity and you know strong people in my family so where'd she go to law school at she went to law school um in san diego and your dad he went to law school here in los angeles no shit. yeah and they met here they met in the courthouse in las vegas holy shit yeah my mom was a tv news reporter and my dad was a prosecutor and he would um, pass her in the hallway. And he always tells us that he would see her on TV and say that he's going to marry that woman someday. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then she went off to law school. And I think they kind of like were dating other people. And then when she came back, 
I guess they met at a bar or something, and like he couldn't keep his hands off her. That dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, like court in Vegas must be completely different than anywhere. Like Vegas is a, like a completely different place. Vegas is an insane like asylum. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how I grew up there. Like I went back last weekend, and as you get older. You're, you know, your hometown means different things to you and you can kind of put into perspective your childhood and it's such a crazy place to grow up if you think about it. Now, as you were growing up, did you, were your parents pushing for you to go into the law field? Um, I think that was kind of something that was maybe like an underlying expectation. People would always, uh, whenever I would see them out or their cohort, they would be like, oh, are you going to go to law school? You know, do you want to be a lawyer when you grow up? And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> Never. So you knew it already. It I just knew I wasn't, that wasn't for me and at all. You got accepted into American University. I I went to college. Um, I went to three colleges. What was um, the first one? It was a small school in Vermont called Landmark College. And it's uh, for people who have learning disorders. Okay. Yeah. And then I have ADHD, so I learn differently. Which is the nice way of saying retarded, but I can say that I have documentation. So, um, but yeah, I uh, I went to a school that like taught me how to learn because I just learned differently. I was always a creative person, visual, um, and I just never. I I went to a bunch of different middle schools and high schools. I went to a lockdown when I was seventeen, where I graduated from in Utah. So I I my schooling was never. Um, it was it was all over the place. But you're very book smart. I am emotionally smart. I definitely have a book. I, if I li- if I'm interested in something, I will become obsessed with it. But there's you couldn't pay me enough money to ever study math ever again, ever. I could give a fuck. Yeah, you did what you did, and then you moved the fuck on. Yeah, like weed taught me math, like the math that I needed to know. You know. And how was American University? It was cool for like. You know, it was cool to be in our nation's capital. I got to see Obama get inaugurated. Like, I was a part of, you know, a huge historical moment in time. But um, I was, I just felt like the dumbest person in all of my classes. I could care less about politics. Um, I wasn't inspired by it. I thought it was kind of like Hollywood for ugly people. (laughs) But I mean, no, there's whatever. But I just, I, it wasn't the right place for me. And I even had the opportunity to intern for Congress. Congress, I could have, you know, um, gone off and done something big with that. But I just was never, it wasn't meant for me. So you ended up in Lynn College in what part of Florida? Boca Raton. Okay. <laughs> All the Jews. And, All uh, of them. And that's where you got your degree from. I got my master's degree from Lynn. Um, and, uh, yeah, I stayed down there and I worked uh, in the hospitality industry i always worked since i was 15 in hospitality um and i worked in marketing out of college and you got a degree in marketing yeah a master's a master's yeah in marketing Mm -hmm. no shit yeah and then when did you start smoking reefer (laughs) as soon as i pretty much left my parents house when i went to college 19 when i went to vermont Vermont. yeah Yeah. that's where it's i mean you have to smoke yeah (laughs) that's the place like everyone is on something there (laughs) And then when did you first decide to get on stage? Um, almost three years ago. Yeah, um, when I was 29. Yeah. What made you want to get Because you said you... I had tried to get on stage many years before that. I, I did improv as a kid. So performing was never... Um, I was never shy of performing. <clears throat> I was always the first one in college who wanted to like get up and do my presentations. And I just liked being in front of people. But... When I was living in Florida, I started going to improv shows. My first stand-up show was seeing Mike Epps at the Palm Beach Improv. And um, I would see I saw John Lovitz, Bob Saget. Like I had just fell in love with stand-up um years ago. And then it wasn't until I was just in these like horrible relationships. I was working these corporate jobs out here that I just was terrible at and I just knew that I really one felt purposeless I felt like I was just kind of aimlessly roaming through life I I like you know it really spoke to my depression and just I think I just I was searching for that something and it wasn't until I was getting out of a relationship I was 29 I was living with this guy that was so toxic and my life just wasn't what I wanted it to look like. And for something, for some reason, just like stand up was like, it was screaming inside me. It was like, do stand up. 
And I had seen a friend, um, my friend Sam Grody, she was a sorority sister with me in DC. She does stand up. And I went to see her at the John Lovitz Club, that one that got shut down. Um, at Universal. Yeah, at Universal. <laughs> and I saw her perform and I was like, I could definitely do that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I ended up. Um, finally, after a breakup, I just started writing. I went to, um, Mike's. I, uh, yeah, I started getting on stage. Are you, uh, I don't know how to ask you this. Are you lucky at love? (laughs) Am I lucky in love? Like at love? Lucky at love. Do you? Um, I have always. Do you attract fucking knuckleheads? (laughs) I've attracted a variety of men in my life some of them were men some of them questionable um i've always been in relationships since i was 15 years old i've always like loved having boyfriends i've dated people since i was 15 so i've had a bunch of boyfriends i guess i've had experience in dating guys um who were all different kinds of uh healthy and unhealthy for me (laughs) now when you broke up with that one dude and Mm -hmm. you got into stand up like I did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like it was all part of a metamorphosis process. Yeah. It was all part of a. I'm gonna stop doing what the fuck I'm doing and get into this. Like right. I got on stage in like June, and in October she told me she wanted to get separated. Oh wow! So I walked like for four months. I walked around like I don't want to be with this person no more, and everything sucked. Yeah. Like everything just sucked. Once I got on stage and here I am, 28, I'm out of prison and and I'm with this woman and God bless her. She drove me to my first open mic. She forced me, like she forced the hand, you know. But it's really tough to explain to people. Sometimes at your, like I got into stand up at the lowest point in my life. Mm -hmm. And then I got into it. At a lower point. (laughs) And then I got all in at the lowest point of my life. Like, the lower I got, the more I got into it. Yeah. Is that how you felt sometimes? I, my first year of stand up, I suffered like suicidal depression. Like, I wasn't like, I didn't have um, a plan. I wouldn't actually do it, but it it was in and out of my life my first year of stand up. I um, got out of that relationship that I was in at 29 started stand up it was i was working for levity at the time and my uh i was doing social media marketing for them that's really like my my path into comedy was like i used to work at corporate and um i i ended up leaving that job because they wanted to bring someone in house they got rita from the improv let me be a bartender in the lab and they don't give those jobs to like just anyone let alone women and like i'm not a career bartender (laughs) like i'm in the back looking up you know basic recipes for a manhattan you know what i mean like she really believed in me and so i was going through this breakup she gave me an opportunity at the improv and i was also starting my open mics and writing and getting into stand-up and it just became like my i was like this is what i'm in love with this is this is what I've been missing my whole life. This is what, this is my purpose. It gave me meaning to my life in a whole new way. Oddly enough, I ended up getting into another relationship this past year. I just got out of a relationship. Um, But he works in comedy and I just like, I just fell in love with comedy. Like that was like my, that was my main love. And then everything else was secondary. And like, he kind of saw that process of like my first year is, was rough for me. Cause I was going through kind of just like everything in my life. Like, okay, now I'm in a place where I can put meaning and like finding the funny and my pain and my trauma. And also just like, you know, I think, a, it's a crutch for me is some of these relationships like I've always just maybe been afraid to be fully independent like which I know I can be but like who wants to be alone at night you know what I mean like and I don't I'm not a random uh, casual sex person it just doesn't fulfill me so I think that the more that I fell in love with stand up the like less like my relationship became began to deteriorate 
like it. It was so weird to me how you think about the first five or six years of a stand-up. You know you're in love with something when you give up your apartment. Yeah. Like, you know you're in love with something. Like, you have to force your... You have to force yourself to not be home. Yeah. Like, like I can't be home at night. Like, I don't even know what that is. No, like, if there were nights that I would choose to, like, spend... In my first years, I've, I, I, I would have this guilty feeling. Like, I'm cheating on my, like, f- my love. You know what I mean? And I... And, like, that's when I was like, okay, this is this is something that means so much to me and it just like i knew that i needed to like focus on that and like after being in all of these relationships that just didn't work out like thank god none of them wanted to marry me you know and they they took it that far like thank god it didn't work out because it was a point it was i'm at a point where i was like okay this is this is what i've been missing in my life and this is what i need to feed you know what i mean kids kids do I like kids? Yeah, do you like kids? Did you ever see yourself having children? <laughs> um, maybe one day, like when I'm older, <laughs> in my forties. Women are having kids in their forties, so Yeah, my wife has it at forty four. I'd so. I'd I'd be a great pregnant forty year old. But right now comedy is Comedy. Right. I'm this is a, what I, this is what I'm gonna do, no matter what. Like it's just amazing. You know, when you look up insanity and like a dictionary is doing something over and over again with the same mm-hmm. results, you know? Mm-hmm. And I always think about that when yeah. I dealt with comedy all those years, that people would look at you like, you're fucking insane. <laughs> you're living in your car. You're delivering pizza. Yeah. But I was getting on stage three nights a week, and then afterward I would talk comedy till three in the morning at a Denny's or what. We would go to a supermarket yeah. and buy cold cuts and just sit outside and talk comedy and questions and bookers and you know it was just endless with me yeah like by 94 i went home at night to read comedy biographies wow like that type of shit somebody sent me a picture today that blew my fucking mind one of the guys that helped me out in the beginning his name was uh george george mckelvey George McKelvey had been on The Tonight Show like 13 times. Oh, wow. And he started with, uh, you know, Johnny Carson, like mm-hmm. the 60s and shit. And George McKelvey, like when everybody hated me, George oh. McKelvey dug the fuck yeah. out of me. Like, no, oh, he's too dirty. You know, we don't know. He's just starting out. Uh, it, it was just really weird that George McKelvey would call me and go, what are you doing this weekend? Come open for me. That's so cool. I could only get you 50 bucks or 25 bucks. And uh, he was just really good to me. And then there was a, there's a big time manager now in town. And I know her and she knows, you know what I'm saying? Like we know each other, but I know her from way back in the day when she was robbing people. Oh, wow. Like when she would tell people, you can't do the open mic at this club until you take my stand-up course. Oh, wow. So you would have to pay, like, you know, yeah, three bills for eight weeks of her course before you got to be picked. They only pick four people a weekend. For the wow. open mic? For an open mic. How long are they doing? 15 minutes. Okay. So this is how retarded it was. Like, yeah. So if you did her class for eight weeks, then you could do 15 minutes. So they're doing a documentary on the Denver comedy scene. And they want me to do it. And when they contacted me the first time, I spoke highly about George McKelvey. And today they sent me this picture. Oh, wow. 1969. <gasps> Who's George McKelvey standing with? In his book, he credited George McKelvey. That's fucking Steve Martin. Oh, wow. In 1969. He's so young. He's a baby. Look at him. So, George. No gray hair. Oh, no my white God. hair. No, nothing. Look at him. <laughs> to be, he, he looks the same. That's pretty fucking crazy. Which one's McKelvey's the one McKelvey's on the? McKelvey's the one on the right. Wow, and young, that's that's young crazy. Steve can get it. So fucking, <laughs> I never forget. George McKelvey called me one Sunday night, like I was probably feeling sorry about myself, about to do a pound of blow, <laughs> and he called me like at six, and he goes, "Where are you?" And I go, "I'm home," because I had a page of those days. Yeah, and I would to, I would have to run to the gas station to call people back. This is <laughs> a fucking nightmare. 
Oh yeah. my god, I can only imagine oh trying god. to get booked back then with beepers and pagers and beepers. You yeah. actually have to keep a calendar. Like who walks around? I'll How do you never, remember your dates? I'll yeah. never forget a booker telling me, "Don't leave me a message anymore." You have to send me an email. Wow. On Monday, and I told her to go fuck us. <laughs> like, I'm not emailing you. I'll no. call you. And then, they used, then there was another comedy scene where they would put gigs up. There was a, a like a guy who booked rooms. Oh, wow. And he had like eight rooms in Nebraska. And on Monday, he would put his availability, what clubs were open that week. Okay. And you had like... 10 seconds to oh it was like hit that him back like, yeah ten he would seconds. yeah like 10 seconds <laughs> you're like you know, how many fucking comics yeah. in that area you had 10 seconds it's like <laughs> it's like when you have a, a southwest plane ticket yeah and you're you trying gonna, to check in cuz you want to get a1 a1 yeah but you you wait 10 seconds you're and like you, yeah. 860 and you're like what the fuck what like the who fuck? how every, who who is the, who, who every, what, who's wife Whose wives are everybody's at home like this, looking at that <laughs> fucking refresh, second, refresh, with refresh. The second, right to I the am second, that girl. I am that right girl. Right to the second, you know. <laughs> so it was shit like that, you know. I mean, there was just so many different. What uh, about fax machines? Do you ever have to fax things? You, you had, had to fax, fax in your availability. You fax your, your bail. <laughs> Jesus. I remember when I was first here, and I was trying to make the transition from. Okay, so I got into the comedy store. I'm working the improv. Jamie doesn't let me work the club, but uh, I do Latino night, which is just as good. Mm -hmm. There was 300 people there. Yeah. And I fucking just was stuck. I didn't know what to do. I had I had like maybe three clubs that hired me then. El Paso hired me as a feature act. Tribble. And I think there was somebody else that hired me. So I went and I got a bunch of numbers from people. Like at the comedy store, I would ask people where you're from, and they would go DC, and I go, "Who do I call in DC?" Yeah, and they gave me the number. DC was John X, Boston was this other guy that booked Club Fifty Six, and every Monday, fucking nine a.m. Even if I snorted coke till seven forty-five, <laughs> you were out know, here at six a.m. I wow. would start, so they would have the fax at nine a.m., and I would fax. What you would do is put like you know. Uh, fucking Wolfie, and then put the whole month of January, and then you know, you would put a calendar and then give them your dates and what was open. But for you to fucking get booked, you had to lie about a date on that. Oh yeah, to make like, sure I can't do it this you, week. I'm yeah, too busy. You, already. You're exactly. You no, don't see you, you have to see that you're working on the club. Right. If you send them an empty calendar, you, you get who got. <laughs> So you That's had to make right. sure he didn't know who that club was or call and right. say, um, Wilson's working that week uh, in June. Uh, what do you yeah. think of her? And if he, You know what I'm saying? So it's you like to, get your mom catching you at, not at your girlfriend's house. You were out yeah, somewhere else. So you <laughs> had to call and make up. So I took a job selling nuts and screws. Oh, wow. On Ivar between Hollywood Boulevard. I live and, right down there. And uh, what's the one on top of Hollywood? Not so Franklin? Franklin. Franklin. Yeah. So where the pizza place is? Franklin and Ivar? Yeah, Franklin and Ivar, right across the street, there's a pizza place. Okay. A uh, well-known pizza place. Joe's Pizza? I don't know how it does now. It used to be good when the guy Not Joe's it. Pizza, right? No, it's, but I, I'm a, yeah, Joe's Pizza is maybe a block right, away. Right, right, right. Two blocks away if I'm headed west. Okay. So there was a place in there that you, I, I had to be there at four. In the morning? Oh. Because you have to sell contractors. Okay. On the East Coast. Nuts and screws? Nuts and screws <laughs> when they get to fucking work. <laughs> so I would just snort coke till three. Hells yeah. The store would close at two. I would keep my car in the back of the store and just pop the seat back and lay back. I would do a couple lines of coke, bang one out. <laughs> and then fucking head over to Ivar and sell screws, catch a seven o'clock thing. But at about six, I'd start fucking 
faxing motherfuckers. I didn't have a fax. <laughs> where are you? Where are you out fa- finding fax machines? I was a homeless fucking guy. I was a homeless <laughs> he's doing it from work. He's saying. So I got, oh, I got a job oh, just, just to have a fax. fax. <laughs> so I would make money from seven from, from four a.m. to six. <laughs> you guys think I'm here? I'm just here to use your fax machine. That was basically <laughs> it. Dope. I went to the make money. I was making like eight bills a week selling nuts and screws. Yeah, you know, that's was smart only, though. It was, and I would leave the fucking like they would say. After you make a hundred dollar minimum, you go home. Yeah, I would make fucking two hundred by six, and start faxing at six a.m. I would fax every club owner. I'd have a notebook yeah. with fucking dates written across it for checks, and what the result was. You have to. You're a businessman. Yeah. You're a CEO. Yeah. So you know you don't want to call the guy and go, "Hey, Rachel, hi, Joe Diaz. I want to know if I could work your club." And she's like, "You just called me." last monday yeah. what did i tell you so you have to keep records right so i had a notebook just even then just for who i contacted what bullshit story i told them in those days they would say send the tape no tape wow no tape you're not getting shit it's a that. different ga- it's just different completely different yeah. now most people wouldn't even because they, i bet you half of us wouldn't even be around if it was like that no. No one would even. That was. They a can't even tie their job. shoes. Some of these people. No, it was a different. <laughs> they don't game. even shower before they hit the mic. You know what I mean? It like, was a different game. You had a. It was a day job. You think some of these people are going to keep you an organizational a, notebook? You had a real four-hour day job yeah. every day. On top of your writing, you had to stay on time, and then you had to, and then you sent those, and don't think you got work. Like I didn't say nothing about getting work, did I? Nope. That was endless. That was endless. That was endless. And then once in a while, a number would come up on your page. And he, it would be like Yoder's booker. Mark Cano was his name. And he would go, hey, Mark, whatever. Joe Diaz, yeah. So you're in Michigan. And, you know, like he, I would put like Joe's Comedy Club. Yeah. And he would go, you're going to be in Michigan that week? Yeah. All right, give me the name of three headliners that you've worked with. And let me call around and I'll see if I could put you For in there. References. And, and then so. you wouldn't get it. Yeah. Damn. And then you wouldn't get it because that's it. What, they that, wouldn't vouch for you? Like, no. You know, it, it, now he has to get a hold of them. Right. You know what I'm saying? And all that shit. And he forgot. So now you'd have to call him and say, hey, what about that week in Detroit? And he'd go, okay. You know, I need you Thursday, Friday. It's one night. And he would put you on the string of one nighters. I still remember going from like. Fucking Niles, like each I mean, like the bottom of Michigan, all the way to the fucking top. Like, uh, no, Niles is on the bottom, and Ish I mean is on top. Traverse City, like, you wow. would stop. It would be like five hours a day of driving. You know, like five hours here, then five hours there, then you went here. So it was like a fucking adventure. Damn. But that's how it was. Like, yeah. it took, and then. I would bother Rachel for a year. <laughs> Rachel, Joe Diaz, nothing. I'll call you when I have something. Yep. Send me a tape. Who do you work with? Give me the name of three references. And right about when you're about to give up, Felipe walks up to you and goes, hey, fool, <laughs> what are you doing next week? Do you want to go yeah. to the Jacksonville Improv? And you're like, I've been bugging them for a fucking year. <laughs> like, I've been bugging them for a year. They keep telling me no, and now you make one phone call, and I'm featuring. I got my own hotel room. I don't have to sleep on the floor. No, you don't have to sleep on the floor. <laughs> I don't have to sleep on the couch. No, you don't have to sleep on the wow. couch. You're like blown the fuck away. Yeah. That's that's the angle. Like there used to be a catch a rising star in Vegas. You're too young for that one. What is that one? That was in the Excalibur. You're too young for that Wait, one. Wait, but I was, I was. You were a young girl. Huh? Yeah, I was alive. No, you were alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a club? It was in the New hotel, York Vegas, right? The hotel was the Excalibur. Yeah. And it had, like, a sword theme. Yeah. So it's still it, alive. I mean, it's still there. Is it still there? What yeah, is the Excalibur it? is still there. It's still there, the Excalibur? Yeah. Upstairs was Catch a Rising Star. Okay. For a fucking year and a half. It's a club? It a comedy club. It used to be a club. It used Damn, to be a chain. they should still have it. It used yeah, to be right. a chain. Okay. It was in this. See if the one in Jersey is still open. Wow. It was Jersey, like in fucking. Uh, of course, it Princeton. was New Jersey and Vegas. Princeton? No. Princeton? Vegas? 
And Reno, what the Laugh Factory Reno yeah. oh, was Catch okay. a Rising Star. That's why Star. I was like, I've heard of this yes. brand before. Catch a Rising Star was yeah. in Reno, and that was uh, that was wow. Uh, it was a fuck. That was a great. How show. was that room at the Excalibur, the Catch a Rising Star room? It was one of the, before you were saying that you worked yeah a week with Dom or whatever. Now yeah. I was in love with comedy at this point. I had been doing comedy, I say roughly ten years. I had opened up for Rogan, Mencia. I had opened up for Paul Rodriguez. I had opened up for people. And I got a week with all the bullshit I tortured Catch a Rising Star <laughs> for a fucking year and a half. <laughs> and I called that motherfucker every Monday yeah. at 901. You know my shit. Oh, yeah. My shit is the real deal. On <laughs> Sunday nights, I would get home and send uh, headshots to casting people. Every Monday was my headshot day, so they would get them on Wednesday. And I would send tickets to the comedy store, free passes to the comedy store, and the improv. That's cool. This is what I, and I remember going in for an audition for Sheila Jaffe one time, and I ate a bag of dicks. Aww. Like I ate a bag of dicks. Like I went in there all gung ho with like a, <laughs> like a robe on. It was like a boxing coach and shit. And I just ate a bag of dicks. And she goes, Thank you for coming in. And the assistant goes, <clears throat> and Sheila Jaffe listened to me. She goes, oh, yeah, hold on. I have something for you. She gave me back a stack of headshots. Oh. I mean, 30 headshots with resumes, <laughs> tons of free passes from the comedy store. She gave it to you back? Yeah. She's like, I don't need this. What a bitch. No, no. She ended up booking me. Okay, perfect. We love her. Great years okay, later. I was like, no. It's just that was the job. Yeah. That's how much the job entailed. Yeah. Now all you no, gotta do she's is, not a bitch. Now all you gotta is do is she still alive? <laughs> yeah. Now all you have to do is click a button on your computer. Oh wow. But every Monday I yeah, would wake up. Yeah, it's so up, different. I would wake up and mail shit. Tuesday was drop off shit. So every day I had a different job. Right. So now Monday it's just was, you can just email fifty people in remember, one. Remember before nine eleven you could walk into the studios. <laughs> oh. Okay. It was like that? I could walk into before nine eleven. They took they took studio before access nine, too. Before nine eleven, I go to Fox to the, the <laughs> gate and go. I want to drop off a package for Rachel Wolfs. Wow! And they go just park over there, and make it quick. And he would. Do park. they make you take off your shoes? No, no. This is this is this was like it was very open Fox. So yeah. I could go to Fox and go, I want to drop off a package for Christian Kaplan. They would go park there, run upstairs. Don't take more than three minutes. Oh wow! And you could run up. Drop the package off. See the assistant. The assistant will look at you because they're looking for a person like you. Right. You just don't have an agent or your agent's a schmuck. I would drop off my own shit on Tuesday. So Tuesday was drop off day. That agent you want to sign with, they won't sign you. Every Tuesday he got a new package at his door. <laughs> it was. It was. They couldn't get rid of you. No, it was twenty nine dollars for a hundred headshots. I'm coming all wow. day long. <laughs> I'm coming all day long. I would buy 300 at one shot and go to <laughs> every 10 days. You That's know? amazing. And then when I got the agent, I'd show up every other week with 20 more headshots yeah. and resumes. Hey, don't forget me. Hey, don't forget me. I love that relentlessness. It's that's, that's this is what this all is about. Yeah. This is that love that you have. Yeah. That's what. Mm -hmm. you, and, and You're not nobody, going anywhere. Is, you don't read this in a book. No. You don't read this in a mm -hmm. book. No book's going to teach you this. This is, you know, what I, I there was a kid here, Corey Miller, got two half million dollar deals. Real good looking black dude, very funny. He went back to Atlanta to raise his kids because his show didn't get picked up. But he had this thing. Mondays he would write poetry. He wasn't a poet. He wasn't no poet, but that was part of his exercise. Mm -hmm. Tuesday he would write comedy. Wednesday he would write a script about underwater fishing. Thursday he would write fucking uh, comedy, and Friday he would write music. wasn't a musician, but he said he wanted to explore all the different things wow. to make his mind go to all these different places. That's the level I love of that. shit that, you know, when I hooked up with your boy, Felipe, you know, I would meet, we used to have our own acting class. Yeah. Me, Felipe, Silent Bob, Sebastian Satina, we would give ourselves our own homework assignments. Yeah. We said, fuck paying $300, and we critique each other. Ask them. That's smart. Ask them. I will. Ask them. Yeah. And then we'd go from there and go to a weed store <laughs> and fucking stock up on edibles. The guy was a baker 
at a Beverly Hills place and he quit his job baking to open up a weed store and he would bake edibles. So not like regular like edibles. Yeah, gourmet they were edibles shit. that you would get a hundred pounds. Right. Like, like, you know, victory fudge with three layer oh. almonds. And you need pop pop one of them, but next time when are you gonna see them again? When are you opening for him? Uh August in uh, the Ask second, Rodrigo. You ever see a person week, I get, love Rodrigo. You ever see a person get knocked out and have to get carried to a car? That's what happened? And his legs got a drag on the floor. No way. Bro, they had Rodrigo, one guy Stop. on the farm. And they were walking him into a car one one morning in acting <laughs> class. We started popping edibles and shit. Oh that's my when god! They were right, that's when they were rice krispie treats. Oh man! And coconut chiffon cake. <laughs> this guy would make a coconut three fucking layer cake with coconut in the Put middle him out. with THC in that shit. And he didn't know. You go to his house and he'd just be squeezing that's like amazing. this green shit. Or the coconut cake was green. For starters, you oh, thought it was St. Patty's Day. Oh my it's God. It was Saint always St. Patrick's Saint, His chocolate was green. You know what I'm saying? Everything he had was fucking green. That is amazing. And he can, and Rodrigo smokes heavy weed, so I yeah. can only imagine. We're going, we're talking 2000. This is back in the four. day. We were on guinea pigs with the, with we the edibles. 2004. This is when Felipe had wednesday night at el coyotes oh wow i love that place have you been there of course they still do comedy there uh-uh i bet eat there oh you've been there to eat yeah I love not, that place. no not, not el coyote oh you're thinking i'm this talking is a different about place. fucking in the hood Jack. oh no i'm not i'm, I'm talking, talking about, about a different place i'm like el coyote I'm on talking sunset about <laughs> a place where they changed the name four times in one year oh my god because it was a drug bar really like shit <laughs> And, Wait, was it a? Cl- it was just Felipe, a, po- a bar. And Felipe dated the twins, fool. Oh shit! I want to fuck the sister and tell her I don't know which one it was. Stop! Fool. That's amazing. Oh my god! Yeah, they had so they Felipe. give you. Wait, they, they change the name four times a year. Every four times a year. <laughs> oh, paint jobs. Did the twins ever find out about each other? The twins worked there together. Hot, but, both of them were twelves. Wow! Bang! <laughs> Every Mexican chick that worked in there had to be a fucking twelve. Hell You're yeah. not going to find any of those bitches in the detention center. <laughs> That's where they would pull them out of, right? The detention center. They would go down and go, you, oh get God. those four barefoot ones. They're yeah. on fire. <laughs> and they'd take them at the El Coyote. And Wednesday nights was comedy night. That's you got, amazing. You got 40 bucks in a burrito. Oh, that's Or amazing. a smothered yeah, burrito. Yeah. Oh, my God. You wouldn't eat all day. Like, you were that broke. Oh. That you were sweating that burrito. Sweating. Is this place still open? I'm trying to go. It's it's open. It's under a different name now. Oh, of course, it's under a different but name. I mean, it's 40th name. You know, I could tell you if I if I tell you the names today that have been there as open micers, like just like feature acts, you would fucking die. That's so funny. Well, what about that thing you posted? I think it was a day or two ago on Twitter that schedule at the laugh stop. That was pretty crazy. Oh my god. Just like it was you, Tom Rhodes, Rogan, Fitzsimmons, and a couple. It was like big and that's names. That's got to be two thousand one, two thousand two. That's pretty crazy. Damn. It's such a fucking journey, guys. That, that it's must be pretty, like like I can't. Whenever I see stuff like that, I'm like, what if I see Rachel in twenty years and and we were on the fourth wall list together? Like, yeah. Like, it, like it, that's it, it's pretty cool. That's to what see. I'm saying. It's like. I see pictures of people of you guys from the past, and it's like, wow, this is a moment in time and like Josh history. Josh Wolf posted one a year ago. Yeah, of a l- open mic list, me, him, Darren Carter. And oh, I think I remember Dave that. Chappelle. Yeah, that's like, insane. You know, like you know, this is Dave Chappelle before. Yeah, Dave Chappelle. You know, I'm not good. I'm not good at saving stuff like that. I don't. You got I'm, to. I, I never. Do you I don't, save set lists? No, I don't really say. I, None of it. I take pictures occasionally, but. Very I, that was never something that I I, I just don't even think about it. But I got that, a folder in my comedy yeah. store set list. Yeah, uh, a folder at the bottom of my drawer. On one side it's set list, and the other side is call sheets. Wow. All the big call sheets and the little miniature ones they put in your fucking green room. Wow. Yeah, you gotta so got to save those. those I mean, you don't have to. No, it it, it, it would They're be cool. Memories. It's like it's your own little museum. I like lo- I have my like comedy notebooks like that I've that I've already like I'm saving them like I it's an honor to like oh fill another another you know wait, what I mean wait till you look at them yeah ten years they can be like now. what an insane person <laughs> wait till you look at them ten years from now and you go the thought that I did this material and <laughs> yeah. Montreal for a showcase 
like in front this, of all the biggest agents. Yeah, like ever. this is the material I chose to do. How embarrassing! The biggest <laughs> night of my life because you'll still have that set, yeah. the set list. Like you'll have your uh, your diary for the day, and yeah. then that night before you go out, you'll have like the set list before you know APA. Um, APA was huge when I got it. They gave me a showcase one night. I found its set list about four years ago. Oh wow! And I wanted to run into a wall head first. No. <laughs> I swear to God, I wanted to run into a wall head first. Like the topics were just horrendous. Like That's I remember, so like funny. a topic and a joke, just horrendous. Like you look at that shit and go, "I'm going to be regretting." All, I'm going. There's going to come a day where I'm going to regret all the eating ass material I've done. Yeah. Home when you have a little. Not stuff. the eating ass. The material. <laughs> right. Listen, man, you... No, it's a part of my you life. You say it. You know, you say it on stage. You know, that's why comedy makes you so vulnerable. Yeah. You say this shit, and you don't look back. And guess what? When I wasn't saying this shit, I didn't have a career. Yeah. So when I was talking about all that goofy shit the first it's 10 true. years of comedy... And I thought I was making strides, but I was a regular at the store. I was a regular at the improv. You were just a guy cracking jokes. <laughs> okay? You yeah. were just a moron that got good at cracking rehearsed jokes. Right. It's not till you go into that second layer of the epidermal and start saying, let me tell you what I did, and then bring it to life with a joke and make them screech a little first. Right. And then go, oh, we didn't know you were going there. Yeah. You know, this the first ten years. You're just doing knock knock jokes. Yeah, you're just yeah. a fucking wedding photographer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What's you're that? a bar mitzvah DJ. Yeah, you're a bar mitzvah <laughs> DJ. You it, know, it's pretty good. Like, I I did a show with Jesus Trejo last night, and I like even if I, I like last night wasn't my best set, but even seeing people do well, but then seeing someone like him, there's just a different level of yeah. laughter, and the laughter is more consistent, and it's just it's like. It's like seeing like a superhero. Like it's it's pretty crazy to see someone who's doing what you want to do and doing it at like such a higher level. It's like, so oh, inspiring. Shit. Yeah, like you never want to be the best. Like for me, I don't ever want to be the best comic in the in the room. Right. You know what I mean? Like I want. Like, well, you do, but you don't. <laughs> yeah, but like I I always hope that there's someone around that I can learn something from. Right. You know, not even if it's not the you know whatever. I mean, like we said on Monday's podcast, I remember years ago watching Rogan at the Union. <laughs> at the Union, it was a bar next to, across the street from Miyagi, which nobody knows what I'm talking about right huh. now. It's across. The it's street changed from, the name three times. Yeah, it's the Pink Taco. <laughs> oh, okay. The Pink Taco. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Across the street, mm -hmm. if you go 30 yards, I forget what it is now, it was the Union. And okay. I had been working with Joe for about three years at the time, and I saw him have great sets at the store, but that night he was on Pinpoint. And every young comic in the room from I mean I can't even tell Nick DiPaolo was there that night like everybody looked at him and except for maybe Nick DiPaolo and a couple other guys that were in the room higher level guys all that whole core I was with like I wasn't jealous of Joe but I knew that if I did the work that was going to be me in 10 years yeah like that's all that's all like yeah. there was no like it was like wow and then Boom. Sometimes you catch performances that'll doubt you. Right. That you go home and go, it's time to get on Zip Recruiter. <laughs> I'll never get that good. Oh, the no. first time I saw Stanhope in 96, like I had, I knew Doug, but I worked with Doug in 92 and 91 and 96. He was a complete different animal that I went. Like, I had a gig that Saturday. I saw him on a Friday, and that Saturday, I canceled. Wow. Like, that's how shocking and how good, precise, timing, yeah. free was the word. Right. I didn't understand that you had to be free. He was free. He right. was out of the cage. There was no holes barred. It was Stanhope fucking coming at you, people walking people grabbing their purses and paying their bills and he's yelling at them as they're walking out, go fuck yourself, where you going? I got an abortion joke, you gotta hear. You know, like just tormenting them as they walked out and you're sitting there going, I just want people to sit and laugh. Yeah. What point are you happy that people walk out? Yeah. 
he had flipped it around. There was another comic in Seattle that that was his thing, to go on stage and grow. There was two of them, a girl and a guy. That they, <laughs> we're going to make them walk. Well, you, uh, you won the war, but you lost the battle. Right. Stanhope was doing it a little differently. Stanhope was winning the war and the battle <laughs> because as he was throwing you out, people were laughing that right. he was throwing you out. Well, wait, you, you're not going to hear my tit fuck joke. Don't go nowhere yet. Right. And, and the woman would be, I've never, you know, like it was yeah. fucking nuts. Like what, you know, and then I heard what he was doing down here that he would do sets at the improv and just disrupt the show. Like the show would be fucking disrupted. Like all these neat comics will go up with their notebooks and their fucking swarmy shit and they would get nothing because what they had just seen was so surreal. The first time I saw Stan Hope, I cracked. But then the second type of performance I saw was Rogan at the Union, and I go, wait a second. Two years ago, I wasn't even, I was fucking yeah. delivering pizza, delivering Chinese food. Now I'm close with this guy, and yeah. I'm able to see this, so that means I'm making progress. Right, exactly. You know, you're making progress. I know that that'll be me in eight years yeah. if I get on stage every fucking day. Exactly. And when you're at that point and you say, I'm getting on stage every day. You fucking mean it. Yeah. Like, I'm talking about, hi, this is mom. I'm coming to visit you. And you're like, I hope not, because I got a weekend up in Fresno this yeah. week. I mean, it gets to that point. Yeah. When you're like, mom, I don't have I had to leave time. my best friend's wedding. Yeah. No. I, I was in Vegas. That's the discipline. I went, my best friend is the one wedding I wanted to actually be at. I, I got to be there for an hour that's the discipline i saw them smooch <laughs> i saw them i ate some i ate a plate of food i did i eat i took the food and i dipped i i wanted to be there more than anything but i was like i i want to be on stage more than anything else you know but this is what i really want and when, i get when it when it first clicks the discipline becomes intense yeah the discipline that you have to put on yourself mm -hmm. like the word vacation is disappears yeah. The word day off disappears. The word wedding disappears. Like, there's so many things that just disappear. Mm -hmm. Relationships. Like, relationships disappear. If you really want to do what you want to do, mm -hmm. that person will leave on their own. Yeah. Because they know they can't compete. Mm -hmm. I can't compete. Yeah. Just, guess what? My friends and I are having this thing for every <laughs> night. And you're like, unless we do it at 11. Yeah, exactly. What do you mean? And, but you can't be doing comedy. It has to be that one night off when you do comedy. Stores open 365 days a week. What does that tell you? But yesterday, you did comics, and you did the pizza <laughs> place, and you were so funny. That was yesterday. I got to earn my stripes today. Yeah. And you get this weird discipline to you. And, I mean, I got to the point, and you get Josh Wool. Next time you go up there, you go, Josh, all those years where you were having parties in L.A., did Joe Diaz ever show? Not once. <laughs> and he was pretty much my roommate. Yeah. I always had a spot to do. I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. There was a girl who broke up with me because she was into that shit. You know, my brothers are coming out to visit me. Got nothing to do with me. Nope. That's got none. That's your brothers. Mm -hmm. no, I ain't got no brothers. My sister's in <laughs> Cuba. And if that <laughs> bitch comes over, she's going to get the same treatment. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. That's why I love people who date comics and they're not in the business. Mm -hmm. See, as comedians, you can't be with another comic. Why? Because it's not going to work. How do you know? I, I've been here for 22 years. But if there are people, there are comics who do, it does work out. Why take the chance? Okay. Why take the chance? Why take the chance? What because do you... Because what happens? What happens if you start dating, dating Lee today? <laughs> okay? You and Lee fall in love. And okay. And you move in together. Okay. And now... You start booking gigs. Okay. You got to take this more to deal with you. No, so the first six months, it'll be fun. You take this more to deal with you. After that, obviously, you want to be on yourself on the weekends. You want to go do your own three things. Guess who's going to get mad? Boom. What happens? Are you going to get mad, Lee? What happens if you <laughs> date this fucking more to deal <laughs> hey, We're both more to And you both showcase for Montreal. Right. But you get picked. How are you going to tell her you got picked and us fucking ass is going to stay home? Oh, Guess whatever. what she's going to want to do? Well, I'll just come with you. 
I don't want you can't come with me. I, I you I, weren't invited. I don't even think that like for me. I feel like it could work if no, it couldn't. It's not gonna work. Well, see, like it's I, never gonna work. I even noticed a little bit of what you're talking I about. Never gonna just, work with just friends, just like comedy friends wanting to come to gigs and. No, 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 I don't know. I just stand I, up as you and a wall on a microphone. If you want to yeah. join the band, join the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go do reunite with fucking uh, SWV or something. Be the white chick. That's the bad mistake that you know you don't. So, who do be- you date if you're a comic? Non comics. You date non non comics. Non comics. But then you have to train them from. What night. about Natasha and Moshe? There's a couple. That's one. What in about a million. Tom Segura and? Uh, like I said, there's Christina. One, there's one in a million. But the percentages. What about Rich Voss and Bonnie McFarlane? The percentages are very low. Yeah, but I, I, I get what, what you're about saying. the agent from ICM and that other chick? Where's her career today? What about yeah, Ralphie and totally. Lana? Listen, what, I got. A I thousand agree of them for you with you. Think. I, I got agree a with you. Of them for you. I agree with you for the most First part. First off, number two, both all three of those women you named. Yeah. A very, 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 very comfortable. In one, their sexuality, and two, <laughs> and in their skin. Okay. Those three women are not needy. Tom Segura will kick. Tom Segura's wife will bit slap you quicker than I'll slap. You. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bonnie McFarlane will hit you in the fucking head with a shovel quicker than whatever. And the other crazy bitch you talked about, who else? Um, uh, Natasha. Natasha McGarrow. Let, listen, I get it. I come from how many, a how strong many, ass woman let's myself. Say, okay, but well, let me ask you this. How many comics did Natasha and the girl date before she settled down Moshe Cash? Probably a lot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So now you got 20 more on. <laughs> and every time you walk into a club, they look at her with Lisa. Yeah, they used to fuck her up the ass and put it on my <laughs> Wow. Okay. You know what no, I'm saying? No, I, I agree with you. Like I think you for come the most part, go, oh my you God. Sh- No, no, no. I would never. Listen, I don't think people should shit where they eat. No, I'm very no, much no. against that. No. However, I think in those case, those are the cases where I'm like, I do like seeing those people together because they're perfect for each other, because they are comfortable with exactly who they both are, and there's no competition. But I don't think every comic should be out here dating comics. And if you are dating a comic... Like on the third date, once you decide to move in with Lee, <laughs> you got to set your rules. Yeah, boundaries. And you got to set your rules. Yeah. Same thing what happens when you date a civilian. Yeah. Because let me tell you something, my they, friend. Sometimes they I just don't you get death. it. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. I want to marry you, right? Should we get married? <laughs> what does Joey do? Joey's a successful contractor. He makes seven figures a year, six figures a year. Yeah. He's very comfortable in who he is. We start humping, fucking, all of a sudden you spit out a little fucking woofy. <laughs> and you know what? I'm not the fucking nanny type. Yeah. So you're going to go on the road with Dave Chappelle and yep. Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stay at home and watch mm-hmm. the kid. You Mr. Got, nanny. You got a better chance of fucking dying. Fucking, <laughs> you understand know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, somewhere along the line, it's mm-hmm. just. I like women who meet. I love dumb bitches who hook up with comics. Oh, you like watching it? Oh, I love it. Yeah. I see the, I've seen that one 300,000 times. Oh, man. Oh, I feel like you don't watch reality TV. I feel you just like have those people are that horror stories. I watch reality TV. I watch life. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I watch life and use people as guinea pigs in my own little private show. <laughs> I would at, pay to watch this show. I'll look at I would you, subscribe. I'll yeah. look at you and Lee, and I'll say, how long is this going to last? <laughs> and I'll be happy if you guys do last, but I'll have doubts about different things. Just I'll just watch it. Yeah. I won't butt in. I'll just give Honestly, it Honestly, Lee, if you got into Montreal, I would, and I didn't, it would make me so happy because in my mind, we got into Montreal. <laughs> okay. Well, now well, she's going to tag along you know with I, you. No. I have a gig that weekend, so you go off and do Montreal. I'm going to be over here doing my gig. And also, if Lee, Lee's been doing it a lot longer than I have. So for me, in that sense, I got to respect that. You know what I mean? Like, but I'm you not- won't. See, I see what you're saying, but even but me, myself, I'm, yeah. I can be a jealous person. I can, no, see, I can see myself being I jealous. date you. That means now I got to take you on the road with me. Not always. We're not married to be on the fucking road together, too. Or how what about, are we, Donnie and fucking Marie? <laughs> how about, how, like, who, who books that show? Sunny Can I, and Chair. Send me, like, give me that booker's number. Like, I'm that, not that's like a, that. 
You're I not, get, but I think a lot of people are. A lot of I'm, people. I'm very. I'm. I'm. I. My first year of comedy was very much as much as it was getting on stage and like writing and and learning that and whatever. It was also the mental side of it and having to deal with those emotions of jealousy and worrying about what other people are doing. And really, I got to a place in my comedy where I'm like, okay, I am confident that like in my material and who I am and like my like that I know that I'm funny and that I'm in this journey. This is a journey for me. It's not like a rush. I'm not everything that I've gotten has come to me at the right time. And when I felt like I deserved it, I'm not one out here like begging for spots. If I don't have a spot, I'm at Mike's. I'm writing every day. I'm getting better as a comic. And I feel like I've I've had to come to terms with that, even with friends, because a lot of my friends were getting stuff, you know, and I was watching that in the first year of comedy. But you know what? I started to get stuff and it didn't stop. I started to get a lot of stuff and I started to and I was like their success was my motivation. You know what I mean? And I just I'm not ever coming from a place of jealousy. I always come from a place of gratefulness and gratitude that I'm even just here. So like I think it takes the right kind of people one to be in comedy and two to date comics to comics. It's never I don't but it's uh, comedy is not for everyone and dating comics is not for everyone nor should it be recommended I dated, to everyone. I, if I dated well, when you say dated <laughs> I, I I fucked around with maybe yeah. four comics and I part-time dated one comic. Were any of them enjoyable for you? It got uncomfortable. At what point? Once you put it in their ass. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I shouldn't well, say that. I, I didn't get to that part. Um, it would even take somebody home. They're a good piece of ass. You're having a good time. But then they do one little thing and it <laughs> blows off the fucking whole night. If they would have done it on the third night, it wouldn't have bothered you as much as the first night. Okay. Like... The four comic chicks I slept with were all looking for something. What do you mean? They were looking for help at some point. Oh, form. oh, I see. Like a from point. you for their careers? <coughs> oh, so they're intended. And at that part of my career, remember, this is this is this is when I was at the store. Right. This is girls that would see me at the store. Right. And go. You didn't think they loved you for you? No. No. No, no, no. This is LA. <laughs> okay. Nobody loves you for you. Aww. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being cynical. I'm not saying that. I, yeah. I, look, I've been mad. I've met her, and everything yeah. worked out. Um, one girl, I kind of, uh, I dated her. I really liked her. Yeah. And I kept it as, as, as detailed as I could. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't think of about six weeks on the road without her sucking my dick. <laughs> so I brought her with me because she was that much fun. Like, yeah. You know, we did coke together. I could tie So it was her a up. blast. I could light her asshole on pussy <laughs> on those nights, on those off nights. Yeah. Three of, instead of paying for the hotel room myself, I'm sharing it with another comic. And that's what I didn't like. Oh, you didn't like no, that? No, when I got back from that, I was done. Oh, okay. Yeah. I still liked her and I still messed around with her. But our road work was done. Wow. Did you Which, did you okay. run into anything with uh cuz you you met you met your wife at, when she was working at the store not she wasn't a com comic but was there uh, any weirdness there with her being at your work or with her knowing with other comics knowing that she worked there they we were pretty cool. It, I kept it under a hat for a year. Can, can I tell you something my parents are an exa a rare example of people who work, work together, together that could stay yeah. Ran a business together and have a su successful marriage together and these are these are not this is not recommended either to, for these people to be dating but those they're you know not what comics. i mean and each of us as a comedian no but they were politicians and let me tell you there is just as much competition to see your significant no, 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 other no, 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 no. i i get the competition part as comics not everybody chooses his career true for a reason <laughs> so there's a little bit of the comedian there's a little bit of we're not completely on our game okay you follow what i'm saying to you we're not completely on our game 
after I was 30, I learned that, like where you are right yeah. now. Now you start learning more about your relationships mm -hmm. and where you are. So I learned one thing. You know what? Rachel's fucking beautiful. <laughs> but I can't date Rachel. You know what? Because she's psycho. Because she's a fucking pocket <laughs> like me. Uh -huh. And that means every fucking day, me and Rachel are going to smoke a pound of fucking weed and we're going to go into debt together. No, we're not. <laughs> no, because we're not. I'm going to be up but, working out. But I'm wrong about that. Catching that money. But if you're an alcoholic <laughs> and I'm a cocaine head, that's it never going to work. <laughs> but if you're a cocaine head and I'm a cocaine head, it's not going to work. Okay. Like after I was 30, I started figuring that out in relationship. So you got to just find someone who does so compatible there's a, drugs there's with. There's a yin and a yang. <laughs> you know, it's a yin and a yang. I'm really, I feel like Rick Messina when he told that girl that comedy doesn't work uh, uh, if you're over 28. I should have never said that. Just in the years I've been here, I saw a lot more people break up comics and a lot more stay together. Yeah. I saw a lot, I mean, a lot. Yeah. You know, when you're doing comedy four or five years and you're into it, like a girl like you, you're dealing with comedians seven nights a week. Mm -hmm. I bump into you, we go to Denny's, we go back to your house, you smoke a joint, you come out with pajamas on, something <laughs> happens. Why are you letting you, my secrets out, and Joe now we, And now we <laughs> date little by little and we try. It's yeah. happened a thousand times, mm -hmm. you know? But it ends kind of weird. And now I got this, like Mitzi Shaw. Let's say you and I dated and we were both at the store. If we broke up after two years and Mitzi found out, now she would make you follow me. Oh my God. Every night. And I would make or me follow you every night. So she would so make. To force you, you guys have to work together. She would make no you. No weirdness. No, 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 no. There's a difference between working together. If you're the MC or, and I'm the headliner. Or like. But when you got to bring me up and shake my hand, uh, even though you left me for Lee. Oh God. Okay. You, you left me. This triangle. For Lee. Literally. So. Now I gotta go follow you, even though I wanna spit in your face, or oh. I left you for your sister. Dang. Would you wanna bring me up without wanting wow. to spit in my fucking face? That's Oof. a complete different emotion she would tap into. That's probably great for the stage, though. Oh. So inspiring. You know, because <laughs> what are you not gonna shake my hand? Yeah, no, I You're definitely would shake your hand. Are you gonna go up on stage and say, this next guy coming to the stage, fuck my sister? Stole my car and cheated on me and gave me fucking chlamydia. <laughs> I think he fucked my sister, the other chlamydia. And we're motherfucker. getting married next week. Thank no, you so much. I, that you, would actually be kind of funny. <laughs> would you say that? No, you have to say, this next guy I love. <laughs> I've seen him on HBO and I've seen him on Showtime and Comedy Central. He's one of our all time favorites. <laughs> Keep it going. And you got, and you got to say this while your yeah. heart's breaking because he's going home to your sister. <laughs> oh my God. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. That builds. That's called the discipline. Mm -hmm. The discipline. Yeah. I'm ready for this it. This is no. This is Lee. Just are you like, ready to fuck my sister? And bring me up on stage. This sure. Is, this is just like the Japs did. You know, there's a discipline. <laughs> There's a discipline. Remember when the Japs when you fucked up? What do you do? You gotta go get a sword and, and, and fuck a zombie. Hari kari. Hari kari. It's a discipline. Hari kari. You fuck up, you cut your thumb off. Yeah. We're not cutting thumbs off in here, nothing. But you have to run the CEO of your comedy. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. It's a discipline. I don't give a fuck if the period is gushing out of my pussy. <laughs> I got a 15 minute spot at the store. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. These are all the things that, you know, I don't care if I'm sick. You know, they just, when you get into that love of it, there's just this discipline that's yeah. like. But I feel like it kind of is like Hari Kari. Just in, a, in the way, like, if you go on stage and have a bad, like, it feels like you're stabbing yourself. And you kind of, like, I feel like maybe the point of Hari Kari is so you learn from it. And hopefully you learn from. You make like you're like I'm not gonna make that mistake again on stage. In some way, I think it's similar. No, you make that mistake again and again to see if it was even a mistake. Okay. That was deep. Oh, okay. I never thought about that. You make the mistake again on stage to see if it was even a mistake. Maybe there was just an audience that was deaf and you didn't get the memo. Right. <laughs> you know, maybe there were an audience that doesn't like fucking sucking and fucking and you didn't get the memo. You know. Yeah. I'm sorry you're turning your podcast into a comedy class to oh no that i'm learning so much i really wanted to get I, to learn about you oh no so interesting oh thank you 
So who do you write for now? I know you write. Do you write? Um, I'm not. I mean, I I've written for publications. I've written for uh, High Times, Mary Jane, Vice, Playboy. Um, right now, I just work and do marketing during the day for the weed industry and uh, comedy at night. And when you say weed industry, who do you? I who work. Your, who signs your paycheck? Uh, Budfeed, Kush Queen. Um, I shoot for a bunch of brands. I, um, yeah, I do social media marketing, so I get a lot of work in the weed industry. It's just you smoking, talking about that product. Well, I do, I do shoots. Um, I am part of a YouTube channel where we film videos. We have like 70,000 subscribers, all about weed, kind of from an educational uh, base standpoint with a little bit of humor. And then I write for uh, publications. I do social media marketing for brands and companies. I run ads on my account. Um, so yeah, I just I try to. Uh, You're then, pretty much making a living off the weed company. Um, not off. fully a living. Like I, I'm between weed and comedy. That's what I make my living off of. Now you also said in an interview that get to know the weed plant and keep it original. Yeah. If you want to get into the business. Yeah. What did you mean by that? When you well. Said? People get to always, know the plant. Yeah, for me, I just see a lot of people who are getting into the industry. I mean, everyone has <clears throat> their intentions of getting into weed. Um, but I just think that you need to really... I, I don't like seeing people who get into the industry and don't have a relationship with the plant. Because for me, it's a Drives medicine. Me crazy. And Drives it's me Yeah, crazy. and it's. I feel like it's like you're taking advantage of something and of people who, uh, you know, this is a medicine. This is something that's special to us. It's healing and it's becoming so corporate. And that's the side of it that like when we voted for legalization that a lot of people warned us about that this is what it would turn into. And, you know, over time, I think things will change. Um, but you're seeing so many different kinds of people trying to get into the industry. And I get asked this question a lot of like, how do I get in? Um, what's the best way? Because I've I've, You've been smoking for two weeks. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know what I'm Now saying? you listen to Bob like, Marley. Oh, yeah, all of a sudden you got a weed t-shirt. That's yeah. what I saw in the very beginning. I saw yeah. a lot of fakes faking the funk. Well, and so for me, it's just like, well, you know, one, get to know the plant from an authentic standpoint. Find why you love this plant. What is it that attracts you to the, to the plant? And then for me, be original. Like whatever you're doing, whatever you're producing, whatever you're putting out there whether it's marketing or you're trying to do a brand or you're trying to do a grow like be original be authentic like find a way to add not take away from whatever is out there i guess you know you brought a blunt i did and we smoked it before the show yes if this was three years ago right now we'd be on our 50th bong hit yeah <laughs> two thousand edibles yeah i had to cut that out for two reasons number one I listened to the podcast and we were putting out shitty content <laughs> because we were stoned 80% Fair of the enough. time. And the other problem was that I was attracting the wrong... Kind of uh, audience? Audience. Okay. I didn't want the audience. I didn't want to ever lie to the audience. I smoke, you know, a fucking eighth every two days <laughs> of 25% and over THC. Okay. And I have a bong. I yeah. do this one bong at a time. Okay, wow. I wake up to three, three before I go lift, three when I come back. Amazing. Two at one, a three before I got to pick I up my I smoke an daughter. eighth an hour. Do you really? I mean, I can go through an eighth in less than a day. Yeah, I, yeah. Could, I could do them in a yeah. day. The bong slows me down. Yeah, I should probably do okay? that more. The bong... I do the bong because it's a bigger hit. And I get the more from my bang. Yeah. When I smoke now, number two, I can't smoke the same weed every day. Yeah. So when I go to the weed store, I got to buy four weeds. Indica, what, daytime weed and nighttime weed? I'm an indica guy. Okay, for sure. If, it, if, if it's a hybrid. OG? If it's a hybrid that's indica dominated. Okay, me too. And the percentages are high, I'll go with that. Sativas just do not work yeah. on me. There's maybe one or two sativas that put me in a different state. But the rest of them don't do dick to me. Yeah, I feel that. I'm an indica dominant okay, indica now, person. In one of your interviews or one of your YouTube videos, I saw that you had ADHD and then you mm -hmm. were uh, bipolar when you were mm -hmm. 12. You know, between you and me, I, I, I don't know what half that shit is. Yeah. I don't want to fucking know. Yeah. But I know, do know that I had the same thing. I yeah. didn't get, I just knew from the first time I smoked weed 
not alcohol, not snorting coke, not eating pills, none of that shit. As far as we concerned, something happened to me. Yeah. If you notice, I'm not a big weed in a group type of guy. Right. You won't see me at weed functions. Yeah. I'm not. That's not my bag. For me, I do it like the fucking Indians. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a ritual. Here. It's a ritual. Yeah. You know, whether as it as it very much. It's a ritual for me, be. a personal ritual. Yeah. I, I can't lie to you, and a lot of people are gonna hate on me for this. I don't give a fuck if it's illegal or not. <laughs> okay. It's a ritual for me. Yeah. I like I like ripping the paper and then gluing it together yeah. and letting it dry. And while it dries, I'm breaking up my butt and I'm listening to it music. And then I put it together. Like I'll roll two joints and put them in a thing and go to when I'm on the road and I'll smoke one before mm-hmm. the first show and before the second show. I really don't want to smoke with nobody. Yeah. It's my own personal little ritual. Totally. You know, if I know that you're gonna be there, I'll bring seven joints. Aww. So I could give you one, your own joint, That's just sweet. in case you blew a fucking <laughs> a fucking terrorist last night. Yeah. Now I don't have to have terrorist germs in yeah. my lung and Agent Orange. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When I was a kid, I would get sick when I smoked in circles. Oh wow. I would get really yeah. sick or whatever. So for me, I, I I never for me it was not about I think that when this weed thing, and you and I both know this, we won't mention no names. I think a lot of people got on the weed boat to sell tickets and to yeah. make people think they were cool or mm-hmm. whatever. It ain't a way to guy like me. Yeah. Because like you, I've been hitting this since I was 12. Right. And I think for even, when I think of comedy, when I think of the comedic mind, and I think of a drug. There's no better drug. Yeah. You know, this morning when I got back from acupuncture, I had a fucking write. Before I came here, I had to write a little bit. I did four or five bong hits. Yeah. And loosened the wing. You got oh, a little man. Canada dry ginger ale it's diet. Nice. And I put it, I, I leave my cell phone in the other room. I go on the living room because I didn't have a chance to go get caught. You know, I had yeah. to do it there. And it's all part of my ritual. I love that. If I could, I don't like smoking while I write. I like to smoke, leave the bong in the other room, and, and then, then I write, and then get up an hour later and go refuel. That's again. a discipline. That's a discipline. Mm-hmm. Get up, move around, and go smoke again in another room. The uh, the common thing that I hear from people about writing high is that it'll seem funny in the moment, but then it actually isn't. Have you guys trained yourself to write high, or or it's, or do you find the same it's thing? It's not about writing funny or not. It's about relaxing you. Mm-hmm. If you read the Stephen King book on writing. It's not about writing a whole page. It's about sitting there for an hour. Okay. It's about you getting up, going somewhere, sitting there facing the sun or against the sun. If you read his book, he sits a certain way towards the sun. Steven Spielberg, the prince, Stephen King, the (laughs) prince of fucking darkness. Yeah. The guy who wrote Cujo has to sit a certain way in a room facing the sun. And he plays music while he writes. And he locks the door so nobody could come in. I don't like my wife coming in the room when I'm fucking writing. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, wow. That's why I go to a, a <laughs> coffee shop and I sit in the same place at the coffee shop so nobody could come up behind me. Wow. You know, I like all these little... Rituals. Rituals. But yeah. marijuana for me has always been a ritual. You know, I get up, I drink coffee, mm. I pop a nicotine gum, <laughs> I brush my teeth. Then I hit that pipe of Hell death. Yeah. About 40 minutes in, by fucking 8 o'clock, I'm starving. Now I can eat my two eggs and bacon. What time do you hit when you wake up? Um, I mean, honestly, every day is different. I wake and bake pretty much every single day. Every day. Different ways. I've been on blunts lately, which is probably not the healthiest, but I just love that little bit of tobacco. I like it, I like it from time to time. I love it. Blunt and a coffee. I go and I work out. Sometimes I'll wait to smoke until after I work out because I like to think of it as a reward. You know, it's my wind down. Um, and definitely when I'm writing and even like on before I get up on stage, like Felipe, when, you know, we're chief and right until the moment we get walk on stage and I had some of my best sets, you know, high as fuck. And like, so I'm just calm where I can like be myself and like some stuff, will, like maybe a joke will just come out. And I'll write it on stage or something. For me, the reefer removes the safety net. Yeah. I'm fucking Johnny Wallenda. You want to be Johnny <laughs> Wallenda? This is your chance to be more Johnny Wallenda. Smoke this. This is another discipline. Yeah. Focus and go on stage, deliver. The audience will read that you're high. Yeah. And they give you brownie points. 
they give you points. So there's a learning curve. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're drinking, you don't get that learning curve. That's true. When you're smoking, you get that little curve from the audience. <laughs> and if you are funny and they know you're stoned and you start giggling, they're taking a ride with you. Yeah. You suck them into your fucking right. nightmare. You suck them into <laughs> your, your nightmare. Fantasy. It's true. You know, you really did. <laughs> I don't do edibles before stage no Mm-mm. more, but I will smoke pot like a oh, motherfucker. Yeah. Because, like I told my wife the other day, I go, this is why I don't like the word sobriety. Oh. Because you're always just... living on a fucking, I can't, I can't, I can't. Yeah. It's like Ma- the opposite of improv. Marijuana <laughs> keeps me knowing that I'm dirty. Yeah. There is something wrong. Or with real. Me, you know? I have always, I've always dreamt of giving up coke and alcohol and pills and all that shit. Marijuana, it's never even crossed my <laughs> motherfucking mind. Like I will smoke till they bury me unless yeah. I lose a lung or an eyeball. Yeah, or I'm the same way. Something. Was it hard for you in New York, or did you be able to bring enough for the entire month? I don't. You know. find weed in New York? I brought fucking two pounds of weed with me back there. When I was there for the three weeks, yeah, yeah. I had eight different types of weed. Oh, hell yeah. They, they you gave, just put it in your bag? Yeah. They, they don't care anymore. 28 ounces. I brought two yeah. of them. I bring a, a gym bag and you dip it in the boxing glove. <laughs> oh, shit. Sure. You know so, and now you have two bags. So if they lose one, you got weed in one yeah, of them. Yeah, and yeah. I don't lose both of them. Yeah, like, well, that's, plus my steep lap near the bag has something. You, you put know, them all in different places. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't vape. That don't work no nah. more. I, I was going like to bring that. you a bag of vapes and I go, oh, that, that was, I still would have taken them and smoked yeah. them just because you gave them to me. No, but they don't. Uh, the vapes do something to me. The it first two throat. of them. And, the, and then I'm spitting up the next yeah. couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a fan. Where do you see marijuana going in the future? Do you see TV shows? Oh, I mean, I've, I've watched Born Appetit and all those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not the um, best. I mean, I, I, I saw a bus today that the whole wrap of the bus was a CBD advertisement. So... It's going mainstream. Like it's it's gonna be huge. I think there's gonna be maybe even a weed channel. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a TV network or if it all just went online. It's really just when oh. mainstream advertising and the people like that are willing to put their dollars behind, you know, cannabis content on a mainstream level. Like what's like Coke or like Pepsi is gonna be the first one to like back or sponsor something like that we're really just kind of waiting and i think honestly if it goes federal that's when we'll really start to see it on a different level you know all over the place it's pretty i don't know who i think it was i don't know if we're bo- both friends with them on facebook but yesterday someone posted a picture that some cbd company had like the time you know how times square look they'll have like eight different advertisements from mm-hmm. the same company it was a cbd company yeah I like, that's pretty i mean cool. it's the future it's everywhere it's in our walgreens that they're selling cbd at sephora it's my friend has a uh, Kush Queen is at Urban Outfitters now. It's a CBD THC bath bombs. I'll bring you some for you or your wife if you guys take baths. Um, <laughs> Joey's a big and for you, Lee, I, oh, you know, you. if you I'm take a shower bath. guy. Okay, okay, but um, I'm not allowed to. I'm gonna sit in the I'll bring bath you some. And soak in the same dirt. I don't know. Maybe your wife. Maybe your. I don't know what you and women your, like you that and, shit. Yeah, they we do. Like, oh, oh yeah, it's, so it's romantic. Who gives a fuck? I take a bath. I whack off. I gotta go. Hell yeah. Once it's flo- once I see that egg yolk floating in the fucking bubble. So why don't you just wait to jerk off? Because who, everybody <laughs> wants to jerk off underwater. You there know you know? go. Well, you let s- me just let you, yeah. It'll be nice with the bath bomb. Where do you <laughs> see your career going in the next six months? In the next six months? Ooh, I'm... What do you want to do in the next six uh, months? Just continue to hustle, writing. Uh, I signed an NDA for some stuff that I'm pretty excited for. So I have some things. I shot my first pilot uh, a couple weeks ago. What so, did you shoot the pilot for? Uh, it was for a E comedy uh, for E, and it was a, a, a game show that had all female comics on it. That was about pop culture called Material Girls. So I'm starting to like I'm I'm open. I'm I got my plans are to learn and to grow and to just be funnier than the day before. And that's like I'm open. You taking acting classes? I'm um, at Second City. Really? Mm-hmm. Good for you. Yeah. Man. So you're really making this work? Oh, this is my life. This is what I'm doing. You have a roommate? Nope. I live alone. Good. My ex-boyfriend, I used to live with one of my boyfriends, but I no longer live with them. Good for you. Yeah. Well, I hope you stay single for a while. (laughs) Because it seems you like the kiss of death. Oh, man. Yourself. I mean, you're uh, funny and you're going. You know what? Right now you're funny and you're going places where I had that extra stress. 
I mean, I'm not. I I'm I'm never looking for that. I'm. I know what I want out of this life. I wanted stand up is my my main love. Stand up is my like I'm married to stand up, you know. And that's what I'm going to be doing to the day I can't walk anymore on stage, and then I'll roll myself. <laughs> but um, you know, I I don't like to plan my life. Like I have, I I I hope for the best. You know, I just I just focus on what's right in front of me. How can people find you? Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Wolfie Comedy, and if they like weed humor or weed content, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Wolfie Memes. And then my podcast on Stitcher, iTunes, and Spotify, Chronic Relief with Rachel Wolfson. And I'd love to have you both on. Where's your, uh, what's the website where they can get your dates and whatnot? Um, I don't really post dates on a website because I'm just, you know, lazy right. <laughs> when it comes to that. But my, I do post my dates and my shows on my Instagram. Um, I just think that's where a lot of my people follow me. You have so. an agent and everything. Uh, nope. Yeah. I have a publicist. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. I recently uh, publicist wanted to be my publicist so i uh that's what i'm saying i i i i have a lot of good things i'm in a good place you know life is happening and i'm just riding the wave well i've been watching you for about (laughs) nine months and uh i could tell you're a hustler thank you you're not looking for any handouts no never uh, felipe speaks very highly of you i'm honored everybody that i've met has spoken very they've asked me if i if I'd known you and I told wow. them no, but this is the first time. It's great to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. You're prettier in person than oh, you are wow. in your photographs Thank and stuff. You. <laughs> and you're always welcome on the show. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Fuck you. So where can they find you, little stony ass? Oh, yeah. Uh, at Wolfie Comedy. That's where they can find me. Well, And I just started calling you Wolfie. I, just I love, love it. I love your name. I love and it. And you look like a Wolfie, so Thank it's you. tremendous. <laughs> so, yeah, anytime you want to come Thank on, you. you're always family. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank you motherfuckers for always supporting us. Do not forget, the only date I got is the Lincoln motherfucking theater in D.C., August 9th. Tickets are moving. I'm sorry. The Borgata is sold out. And I can't have Is it really? Sex- yeah. Fuck yeah. It's been sold out since Oh, that's May dope. Because my family's going and I can't add a second show. But we just put tickets up at the Stress Factory for October. So knock yourself out. You want to go to New Brunswick? <laughs> you cocksuckers there. Besides that, I want to talk to you guys real quick, and then you can go on and enjoy your fucking weekend. All right. Number one, listen, uh, we would we wouldn't be a podcast without you guys, but we also wouldn't be a podcast without our sponsors. And I want to welcome Express VPN to the show, VPN to the show, because uh, uh, when they approached me, I read their information. And I think this is just tremendous because internet privacy is fucking dead. It's mort. And that's the reason why I use ExpressVPN. It runs in the background of your computer or your phone, and then you can use the internet just like you normally would. You download the app, you click to connect, and Viola, you're protected, all right? The features, you're totally anonymous. There's no location tracking. And it shields your identity. And to me, that means the fucking world. And how do you get it? Here it is, nice and easy. You download the ExpressVPN app on your computer or your phone. You push one button, and boom, Viola, you're protected. It's less than $7 a month, and you get a 30-day money-back guarantee. I don't give you nothing unless you got a guarantee. So everybody (laughs) feels good, all right? Everybody feels good. When you hear it on the church of what's happening now. So listen, find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash church. That's C-H-U-R-C-H. And that's expressvpn, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash church for three months free when you buy a one-year package. It's that simple. Visit expressvpn.com slash church to learn more and take back your privacy visit expressvpn.com slash church be protected be safe be confident and take back your privacy that's expressvpn.com slash church listen i told you once i told you a million fucking times about cbd oil 
It's like getting ginseng 20 years ago. <laughs> Remember, you could buy a crack pipe next to ginseng. How healthy is that fucking ginseng? I'm sure when that fucking Tibetan monk invented ginseng, he wanted it marketed next to a fucking crack pipe with a rose in it. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Because picking a reliable CBD is like fucking pulling teeth. It's like meeting a woman with like chlamydia on sunset. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to happen. Lucky for you motherfuckers, I got you into CBD line. And if you see people on Twitter, hit me back. These guys don't mess around. They make CBD products from start to finish. And they got you covered. Whether you want to smoke a vape, whether you want to do cartridges, whether you want to do the shatter. Oh, you're not into smoking? Forget about it. They got a gummy bear. They got a raspberry gummy bear. Mm. It'll make your asshole hairs pop up as you're eating them. You understand me? If you have that hemorrhoid, pop I'll take goes seven. The, pop goes the weasel. All right? And I do the tincture. You put it under your tongue an hour before you go to bed at night, forget about it. And especially if you do two of them, you'll sleep like a fucking zombo. Their <laughs> products are clean, Bobby. And they're not like these fucking fakes you see at liquor stores and shoe stores and shit like this. What I want you to do first, just to see I'm not fucking around, Go to CBDLion.com. Check out their third-party lab results yourself. If you don't fucking like what you see, you take a hike. But I guarantee you're going to like like what you see. And like I told you, they make their products from beginning to end. So what I'm going to do for you today, I'm saving your fucking life. CBDLion.com. Pick something. Go to the box. Click in church at checkout. Get 20% off. Bam. Joey, really? Yeah, I'm telling you, you get 20% off, you little miserable fuck. <laughs> Go to CBDLion.com, put some happiness in your life. Try the tincture. Smoke the vape. Whatever you want to do, they got you covered. You're gonna Even my wife's smoking the fucking vape. She found in the book, of them. when you go on the website, they have what ailments you have and what vape oh, wow. you should smoke. And uh, she's been smoking, like, I don't know, Purple Haze or something like that. You know me, though. <laughs> I don't know what I did this morning, but do me a favor. Just go to cbdlion.com, get the party started, and get 20% off. All right, check out, all right? I want to thank cbdlion.com. I want to thank ExpressVPN. I also want to thank ZipRecruiter and Onnit for having our back this week and always having our backs. But most importantly, I want to thank you motherfucking savages. Go to joeydiaz.net for tour dates. But right now, let's just focus on the Lincoln fucking theater in D.C. I'm not coming to Baltimore. So you cocksuckers, take the ride, bitch. <laughs> I'll see you guys Monday morning, ready to rock, <laughs> tip top of goo. I love you guys. Stay black. Lee, kick this motherfucking mule.